Sports Down podcast, or the STP pod for short. No politics, no drama, no arguing. Just two guys talking sports. I'm your host, JJ Peters. Today on the podcast, we will discuss week 11 NFL highlights, college football update, NBA free agency tracker, UFC 255, and college basketball begins today. Um, we always start off with a poll question, and you can vote on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And the question was, who should trade for Russell Westbrook, the Knicks or Hornets? And currently, it is a tie at 50-50. Um, let's first get an NFL injury and COVID update. Joe Burrow of the Cincinnati Bengals is likely done for the season. The number one overall pick this April was cut off the field in a loss versus the Washington football team. Burrow was on track to have one of his best rookie seasons for a quarterback. According to stats and information from ESPN, Burrow was on track to beat Andrew Luck's passing record for a quarterback, which was 4,374 yards. Burrow was hit by the number two overall pick, Chase Young and Montez Sweat. It was the third quarter when the LSU product hurt his left leg that sent him to the locker room. No word yet on how long Burrow will be out, but there's reports that it could be he could be done for the season and maybe parts of next year as well. After going to the locker room, Joe Burrow tweeted saying, see y'all next year. It was fun. Um, also, Mark Ingram and J.K. Dobbins have tested positive for coronavirus. Um, also, uh, defensive tackle Brandon Williams was placed in the COVID reserve list as a close contact. So they are all out for the game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. But the game currently is in serious jeopardy of being played on Thursday night, on Thanksgiving night. Because of some players testing positive, the Ravens will conduct all their meetings virtually until they travel to Pittsburgh to play their bitter rival, the Steelers. So let's hope the best game of the week will be played and not be canceled or postponed. Uh, college basketball begins today. The NCAA delayed it two weeks, but today basketball is finally back. According to multiple sources, the NCAA has no plans to delay the season or tournament when the time comes. Some games have already been canceled, but teams will have to make up their own games. Every team in the NCAA has not played for almost nine months because the season was canceled in early March. Many teams are ready to get back because or get back to the grind. Similar, similar to college and pro football, the NCAA will allow universities to make the decision whether to have fans or not. The colleges will work with their state and local governments if they can have spectators in the arena. Syracuse is one of the first basketball universities in the NCAA to announce they will not have fans for the upcoming season. The colleges that are allowed to have fans will likely have limited capacity for the season. The first game scheduled on national TV will be third-ranked Villanova versus Boston College as a part of the 2K Empire Classic. Uh, my thoughts are I'm glad college hoops are back. Um, even though most universities won't have or very little fans, it'll be fun to watch. Uh, we haven't seen college hoops since early March because the season was shut down. However, on Wednesday, that will be, there'll be a full slate of games being played that I and most fans can't wait to watch. Is Gonzaga the team to beat or is someone else? Um, will the top tier teams in college hoops be good or will someone else emerge? Um, let's, we'll find out this Wednesday when the season finally gets tipped off. Uh, who is the top team in college hoops right now? Well, if you go by the rankings, uh, most people would say Gonzaga since they're the number one team currently. However, Kansas is pretty solid, even though they're ranked sixth, and they were the top team before the season shut down last season. Uh, don't sleep on Baylor, though, Villanova, maybe even Iowa. All those teams have a real shot of competing for a national championship this upcoming season. Uh, what game is most exciting in week one of college basketball? Um, I was looking over, and I believe sixth-ranked Kansas versus number one-ranked Gonzaga with the game to watch this week, even though 17th-ranked Houston does play Texas, which is ranked 14th this Sunday. But again, you can't compare a number one team versus six in the week of college hoops. Um, and did the AP rankings get it right? I think it's still too early to tell. Unfortunately, because the season was shut down um, before the tournament, we haven't seen uh, many teams, and we don't know what they're like. Uh, similar to the, the NBA draft last week, we didn't really know who the top prospects were because a lot of times we get, we, a lot of times, a lot of people don't watch the NCAA or don't watch college hoops until the NCAA tournament. And that's when we get introduced to these guys. So um, I think Gonzaga is usually pretty good. I think they're solid. Uh, Villanova, Baylor, and Virginia, of course. But again, we probably won't know until a few weeks into the season. I would say right now the link, rankings are legit. Let's get to some MMA talk. UFC 255 was held on Saturday at the Apex Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. The undisputed flyweight champion, Divison Figueredo, took on fourth-ranked Alex Perez to get his first title defense. The other fights in the main card were champion of the women's flyweight division, Valentina Shevchenko, facing Jennifer Maya. The other fights on the main card were Tim Maines, defeating Mike Perry in unanimous decision. In the other women's flyweight division, Caitlin Chukakin defeated Cynthia Calvillo in unanimous decision. The other fight in the main card was Paul Craig of the light heavyweight, knocking out Marcio Rua. Uh, my thoughts are Figueredo looked dominant over Perez. It's going to be hard for anybody to beat Figueredo in the flyweight division 
in the UFC. With the win, Figueredo now has his first title defense in the flyweight division. It was interesting after the fight, UFC President Joe Rogan had plans for Figueredo to fight in December, which is next month. No word yet on when if it will come to fruition, but it looks very promising. Right now, I don't see anybody knocking off Figueredo in the flyweight division for a long time, which brings me to my next question. Can anybody beat the undisputed flyweight men's division champion, Divison Figueredo? A uh, pretty simple answer, no. He's had some rivals, but it's been a while. Many sources have said that the men's flyweight division is very weak, but it's hard to really say when Divison Figueredo will be so dominant in the future. Uh, I just don't see anybody in the flyweight, at least for now, knocking off Figueredo. Uh, who's the next point for Divison Figueredo? Well, it looks like Brandon Marino will be Divison Figueredo's next opponent. Uh, Marino is the top challenger in the men's flyweight division, only behind Figueredo. That will definitely be fun, especially if it's in December, which is only a month. We will see what happens, but I'm predicting Figueredo wins that fight and probably by knockout. Uh, NBA free agency ta- tracker. It's that time again. The crazy free agency for the NBA is upon us, and I will give you the big signing so far in the association. As I have said, it's the crazy time in the NBA, a time where some teams get crazy with their spending and end up regretting their decision that signed to that certain player. A lot of times it ends up trading that certain player as well, but it's still fun to watch all the happenings in the NBA. However, on the other side, some signings end up being really good and the teams get them for bargains and helps them win a championship. And a lot of times too, those players who help them win that championship with bargain contracts get either big contracts by the team or by another team in next free agency when they're available. Uh, Gordon, Hi- Gordon Hayward gets a massive deal with the Hornets. I didn't think Gordon was worth or Hayward was with or was worth another max deal, but he did it. Um, he turned down a $34 million contract to become an unrestricted free agent. A lot of people saying, what are you doing, Gordon Hayward? You have a $34 million contract you just turned down, but he's going to get make $30 million for the next four years. And here, get this. According to multiple sources, the Hornets were chasing him back when he was in Utah. So he decided to opt, to, opt in with the Jazz, end up being an all-star, and sign a nice contract with the Celtics the next year. So the Hornets finally got their guy. Charlotte has been making some moves as of late and might make the playoffs next season. First, they draft LaMelo Ball, and now they sign Gordon Hayward, and there's multiple reports that say they have interest in Russell Westbrook from Houston. We'll see. Uh, Montrez Harrell gets a uh, signs with a crosstown rival. This comes as a shock to me. I thought Harrell was going to stay with the Clippers or sign somewhere east. But the Lakers are able to steal the sixth man of the year on a two-year contract. It's worth about $19 million. Harrell is the ni- as a nice replacement for both Howard and McGee, both left in free agency. Uh, McGee was traded to the Cavs to make room for Gasol, and Howard signed with the Sixers. Harrell is a great big man that is a, is good with boards. He also is a good defender down low and is a great hustler. He brings a lot of energy to a team that he is on. Uh, Fred Van Liet, Vliet is staying in Toronto. According to Woj from ESPN, the deal is worth four years, $85 million. Many expected Van Vliet to sign somewhere else on a bigger contract, but the Raptors were able to keep Van Vliet on a very nice deal. Um, this is big for Toronto because they keep Van Fleet from leaving to another team, possibly in the Eastern Conference. It's crazy to think that Van Fleet was an undrafted free agent from Wichita State, and the Raptors picked him up, and he was able to win a championship with them last year. Uh, Joe Harris is staying in Brooklyn. The sharpshooter will stay in Brooklyn for the time being. The 2019 three-point contest champion is a great addition to the team that will have both Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. Uh, Brooklyn made a great choice of keeping Harris because he gives the Nets more shooting. When the season begins, he will be in the starting lineup with superstars like Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Uh, Serge Ibaka is going to the Clippers. He'll be be reunited with Kawhi Leonard. The 2019 champion Serge Ibaka signing a two-year deal with the LA Clippers. The Clippers are signing Ibaka to replace Harrell, who left the team to join their crosstown rival. In my opinion, I think this is a better move because, again, he can stretch the floor and he's a little more athletic. He won't start, but he definitely gives the Clippers a nice player on the bench. Um, he'll be a great help to the he was a great help to the Raptors and he has a great relationship with Kawhi Leonard. So this is a great move by the Clippers. Uh, Danilio Gallinari gets a nice three year deal with Atlanta. Uh, the deal reported is worth sixty one point five million over the next three seasons with a player option for that final year. Gallinari spent last season for the Thunder after being traded by the Clippers for Paul George to be able to bring the 2019 finals MVP Kawhi Leonard. Gallinari gives the Atlanta Hawks another score to pair up with the young rising superstars, Trey Young and Cam Reddish. He also brings size to the team. Uh, Marcus Gasol is headed to the Lakers. Um, the former Grizzly and Raptor, Marcus Gasol signing with the LA Lakers. Gasol helped the Toronto Raptors in the championship back in 2019 and is a former defensive player of the year. Gasol was originally drafted by the Lakers, but was a part of the trade that sent his brother Pau to LA. Mark never played for the Lakers and spent his first few seasons in Memphis and helped them 
go to the Western Conference Finals in 2013, the first time in franchise history. He was eventually traded to Toronto and helped them win a championship. With the signing, the Lakers are trading JaVale McGee to Cleveland to make room for Gasol. Uh, what a college football weekend it was. Um, it was back on Sunday. Here are some big games, and I will give you my thoughts on the weekend. Games like Oklahoma versus Oklahoma State, Ohio State versus Indiana, Coastal Carolina um, versus Appalachian State, Cincinnati versus UCF, Liberty versus NC State, Wisconsin versus Northwestern, and UCLA versus Oregon. Uh, most of the exciting games this weekend were s- smaller schools that included Coastal Carolina and Appalachian State, Cincinnati versus UCF, Liberty versus NC State. However, seeing Northwestern versus Wisconsin was also very interesting. If you like defense and hate offense, then Northwestern versus Wisconsin was the game for you. However, I thought Oklahoma and Oklahoma State was going to be good, but it really wasn't. Although there were many good games this week in college football. Um, what game stood out to me the most in college football? Definitely the Coastal Carolina versus Appalachian State intrigued me the most. I know it's a Sun Belt, but it was very exciting. I also secretly hope that Chanteliers make a good bowl game, which there's a very big chance they do. Also, another game that would intrigue me was Cincinnati versus UCF. Uh, the Bearcats held on to win, and right now they're in a very good position to make the college football playoff. They probably won't unless one of the top teams falls, but there's still a chance for the Bearcats. Um, can Cincinnati or BYU make the college football playoffs? Probably not. However, I would love to see either Cincinnati and BYU make the playoffs. But unfortunately, some teams will have to lose to have the Bearcats and Cougars even have a chance. And this is why most analysts and myself believe the college football playoffs should expand from four to eight teams. I was listening to Dan Patrick, the host of the Dan Patrick Show, and he said that the college football playoffs should expand from four to eight teams for just this season because many teams will not be able to play their full schedule because of coronavirus restrictions. He also pointed out that every other sporting league expanded their playoffs, so college football should do the following. However, I do agree with Dan Patrick's statement, but I think it's a little too late for the college football playoff to expand the playoffs. And besides, the NCAA does not like to change things, and it took forever for them to set up a college football playoff with four teams. So if there's any fans out there hoping the playoffs are expanded, don't get your hopes up. Uh, who's the best team in the Big 12 right now? Well, currently, I think Iowa State is the best team. Oklahoma is pretty good. Um, on Sunday, defeating the rival, but and of course Texas is is decent, but I think they're overrated. Um, so I think either Iowa State or Oklahoma is the team to beat in the Big 12. As of now, though, OU and ISU would make it to the Big 12 championship game if nothing else changes. So I think Iowa State is the best team unless Oklahoma shows me otherwise in the next few weeks before the Big 12 championship game. All right, so it's that time of the uh, uh, show that we talk about the NFL highlights of week 11. We'll give you all the big games that happened uh, on Sunday and Monday, I guess, too. Uh, Browns versus Eagles. The 6-3 and three Browns hosted the Eagles, hoping to continue their playoff push. The Eagles, despite their struggles, are still leading the awful NFC East. Early in the second quarter, Carson and Wentz would be intercepted. That would be returned for a touchdown. Not much would happen for the rest of the half as the game would remain 7-0. The Browns would punt three times. The Eagles would turn the ball over twice and punt three times as well. Second half is a little more interesting. The Browns were able to score and also get a safety to make it 19-10 and would hold on to beat Philly 22-17, despite a late surge by the gang greed. Mayfield would throw for 204 yards. Nick Chubb would rush for 114 yards, and Hodge would have 73 yards receiving. On the flip side, Carson wins through for 235, two touchdowns, two interceptions, Miles Sanders would lead the Eagles in rushing with 66 yards, and Dallas Goddard had 77 yards receiving while having one touchdown. Uh, seems like the Browns, well, seems like the Browns always seem to win those ugly games, um, but they're 7-3, and three, and they're right now second place in the AFC North, and they have the fifth seed. So right now they would play, I believe, I believe they would play Tennessee in the first round, which could be an advantage for the Browns, but the Titans are a pretty solid team, and they seem like they're always underrated. But we'll see what the Browns do. Man, it's going to be weird to have the Browns in the playoffs. They're very close, and um, if they continue ride, ride, uh, riding Nick Chubb, it's going to be hard to beat him. Uh, Saints versus Falcons. The Taysom Hill experiment began on Sunday, getting his first official start versus the Falcons. For most of the first half, Atlanta led New Orleans 9-3 until Matt Ryan threw an interception that led to a Saints touchdown by, guess who, Alvin Kamara. Then the Saints would take full control of the game in the second half, and they would end up beating the Falcons 24-9. Taysom Hill would not throw a touchdown pass, but he would have two rushing touchdowns and have 51 yards on the ground. Matt Ryan would have a bad game and throw two interceptions. Todd Gurley had 26 yards rushing, and Calvin Ridley had 90 yards through the air. Uh, the Saints are now 8-2 and two and have full control of the competitive NFC South. New Orleans currently has the top seed for the NFC thanks to a Green Bay loss. Uh, Taysom Hill is 1-0 as a quarterback. Never thought I'd see that day. I thought Winston was going to get the start, 
But Sean Payton tricked us all again and said, you know, Taysom Hill's my guy. I'm not sure he'll be the starting quarterback this Sunday, but it seems like that's what the Saints want to do. Again, not sure when Drew Brees is coming back, but I feel like when he comes back, they're going to give it right back to him. Could be Drew Brees' last year, but we'll see. Uh, Titans versus Ravens. The Ravens are in trouble. Uh, with the loss, Baltimore is now out of the playoff race currently. The Titans would beat the Ravens 30-24 to in overtime thanks to guess who? Derrick Henry. B. Moore has now lost to Tennessee twice in a row. The Ravens would have an early lead 14-10 the break, and they would continue their or they would extend their lead 21-10 thanks to a J.K. Dobbins rushing touchdown. But here come the Titans. They would get a field goal and force Lamar Jackson to throw an interception. They would eventually score a touchdown to take the lead, but the Ravens come back with the field goal to force OT. The Titans, though, would get a touchdown on their first possession thanks to a Derrick Henry rushing touchdown. Ryan Tannehill would throw for 259 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. King Derrick Henry at 133 yards on the ground, one touchdown, and Corey Davis, the former first-round pick, at 113 yards receiving on five catches. Lamar Jackson at 186 yards, one touchdown, one interception. J.K. Dobbins had 70 yards uh, rushing, one touchdown, and Mark Andrews had 96 yards and one touchdown. Uh, the Packers were hoping to continue their winning ways as they traveled to Indianapolis to take on the Colts, but the Packers str uh, struggled to tackle and turn the ball for four times. However, the Packers would have an early at half, 28-14, but the Colts made their comeback. The opening drive of the second half was a field goal to make it 28-17. Then they would score and make the two-point conversion to make it 28-25. They would also get a field goal in their next possession to tie the game 28-28. The Packers would fumble. That led to another Colts that it, Colts field goal that would take the lead 31-28. The Packers would drive down the field to make it 31-31 to go into overtime. But turnovers kill you, and the Packers did it for the fourth time and gave the ball right back to the Colts, which they made a game-winning field goal. Colts ended up winning 34-31. Rivers threw 288 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. Jonathan Taylor rushed for 90 yards. Michael Pittman from USC had, had 66 yards through the air. He also added a touchdown. Uh, Aaron Rodgers on the other side had 311 yards through the air, three touchdowns, one interception. Aaron Jones had 41 yards rushing, added a score, and Devontae Freeman had 106 yards on seven receptions and got one touchdown. Steelers versus the Jags. The Steelers, well, they keep on rolling. Pittsburgh remains the only undefeated team in the National Football League. The Steelers started off slow, and the Jaguars were able to get the first points thanks to a field goal by Chase McLaughlin. The Steelers would get a field goal by Chris Paul or Chris Paul, Chris Boswell in the second quarter to tie the game 3-3. Pittsburgh started off slow, but woke up in the second quarter. They would get two touchdowns, one from Big Ben and another Benny Snell rushing touchdown. They had a 17-3 lead at the half. Not much happened in the second half, but the Steelers were able to get a field goal and a touchdown. They would force Jacksonville into four interceptions. Final score of the, ja or the Steelers 27, the Jaguars 3. Big Ben would throw for 267 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. Deontay Johnson, 111 yards receiving. For the Jaguars, Jake Luton would throw for 151 yards, but a career-high four interceptions. Josh Robinson had 73 yards rushing, and DJ Chark had 41 yards receiving. Dolphins versus Broncos. The Dolphins were trying to keep their five-game winning streak alive and have two remain undefeated in his very young career. But Miami would run into a buzzsaw in the Denver Broncos. The Dolphins would strike first, or actually, yeah, they would strike first thanks to an interception from Drew Locke. Tua Tunga, Val, Tua Tunga Valoa would find Devontae Parker. A few drives later, Melvin Gordon would find the end zone on a one-yard rush. The Broncos would be a field goal in their next possession, take the lead, and would hold on to going into half 13-10. Melvin Gordon late in the third quarter would score, and that was would, oh, they would all, that's what they would only need. The final score of the Dolphins ended up falling to the Broncos 20-13. to Drew Locke threw for 270 yards, one interception. Melvin Gordon had a nice day, rushing for 84 yards and two scores. Tim Patrick had 119 yards receiving. For the Dolphins, Tua was benched in the second half, but not because of an injury. Fitzpatrick would come into the game and lead the Dolphins through the air with 117 yards and one interception. Ahmad would run for 43 yards, and Devontae Parker had 61 yards receiving. The battle for the AFCs continued on Sunday night. The undisputed Super Bowl champs, the Kansas City Chiefs, took on the rival, the Las Vegas Raiders. The Raiders got the Chiefs last time they played, and it was on the Chiefs' turf. We jumped to the end of the first half where the Raiders had an early 17-14 lead. On the opening drive in the second half, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire would rush for 14 yards and score a touchdown to make it 21-17 lead by Kansas City. 
but the Raiders answered right back to make that 24-21 lead in the early fourth quarter thanks to a pass from Derek Carr to Darren Waller. The Chiefs would answer as Le'Veon Bell would score his first touchdown as a Chief. On the next possession, Derek Carr would find have another touchdown, this time to the other tight end, Jason Witten. The Raiders led 31-28. On the second-to-last possession, Patrick Mahomes would find Travis Kelsey for the go I touched him with just 28 seconds left in the game. Las Vegas had a chance, but threw an interception to seal the game. The Super Bowl champs would come back to beat the rival 35-31. The Raiders, after being the Chiefs home of the uh, – the Raiders beat the Chiefs last time they played and took a victory around Arrowhead Stadium, home of the Chiefs. Kansas City, including their head coach Andy Reid, wasn't too happy and got the revenge. No word yet on if the Chiefs did the same to the Raiders after winning. Mahomes would throw for 348 yards, two scores, but did have one interception. Clyde edwards Hilaire had 69 yards rushing, two touchdowns. Travis Kelsey had 127 yards and one score. For Las Vegas, Derek Carr threw for 275 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. Josh Jacobs had 55 yards rushing and one touchdown. Darren Waller had 88 yards through the air and one score. And last but not least, Monday Night Football. Dun, 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 dun. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers hosted the LA Rams on Monday Night Football in prime time. The Bucs were coming off a huge win versus the Panthers, and the Rams also had a big win versus their rival, the Seahawks. Tom Brady was looking to get a second win as a prime, in prime time as a Buccaneer. L.A. was trying to continue their lead in the tough, tough NFC West that possibly could be the best division in football ever. The Bucs started the game off slow with the punt, but were able to score two touchdowns in the first half. However, the Rams started off fast and took a 17-14 lead at the break. In the second half, Jared Goff would throw his first interception that led to a field goal to tie the game at 17. A few possessions later, the Rams would score on a four-yard pass from Jared Goff to Cam Akers to make it a 24-17 lead for L.A. For most of the second half, both teams would exchange punting the ball. The Buccaneers would score on a pass from Tom Brady to Chris Godwin late in the fourth quarter to take advantage of the interception that Jared Goff threw. The Rams didn't do a lot and pretty much gave the Buccaneers a chance to win the game. However, the Rams in their next possession would finally do something in the fourth quarter. They would get a 40-yard field goal by Matt Gay late in the game to get the go-ahead field goal. Tom Brady had one more chance to work his magic, but did the unthinkable and threw an INT that would seal the win for the Rams. Final score, LA 27, Tampa Bay 24. Maybe the Rams are legit because right now they're one of the top teams in the NFC. Jared Goff threw for 376 yards, three touchdowns, two interceptions. Malcolm Brown led the Rams in rushing with 20 yards, and Cooper Cup had a nice day with 145 yards in the air. I wish I had him in fantasy. Tom Brady threw for 216 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions. Ronald Jones had 24 yards rushing, and Antonio Brown had one of his best games as a Buccaneer with 57 yards through the air on eight catches. Thanks for listening to the Sports Town Podcast, or the SDP Pod for short. You can find us on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and much more. We release new episodes every Wednesday and Friday. Also, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Sports Town Podcast. If you want to check out more videos of the Sports Town Podcast, click on the left. If you want to subscribe to the channel, click on the right.